Hey everybody, well, we're going to have the talk, at least a portion of the talk. So this is the part where you get the marriage by design sex disclaimer. If you are watching this video right now and you do not know what sex is, I think what you meant to do is click that bar up at the top and type in Dora the Explorer and watch those videos because this one isn't going to be for kids. We're not going to be graphic, but we do want to be real about sex and the dangers of sex outside of marriage. It can be in a premarital context, can be in an extramarital context. The reality of the matter is, sex is a beautiful thing, but it can burn your house down too if you're not really careful. And we want to be real about that and talk with you about that today. Great. Well, let's get into that. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Andrea Warnock. I'm Nathan Warnock. And you are joining us for Marriage Monday on the Marriage by Design podcast, where we get to talk to you all about marriage God's way. That's right. So today we're going to talk about something that we get asked about and confronted with a lot as we get to deal with other couples and help walk them through relationships, and that is premarital sex. Now, Andrea came up with a super clever clever title for this uh, video that I thought was really good called Sleeping with the Enemy and why premarital sex really is sleeping with the enemy when it comes to your relationship. So we're going to come at this topic from an overtly biblical view. Um, We want to take a look at what the Bible says. That's what our podcast is all about. So certainly you can find Plenty of people out there describing from a secular standpoint why sex before marriage is a good idea. Um, You will not have to look hard for that. Um, I would stand in direct opposition to those uh, people and say that, you know what, the Bible's really clear about what sex is and what it's not. And it would be really easy for us to make this a really short video and just go, hey, um, Bible's clear. You shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. It's immorality. Good luck. And then close this video down. But I have found that over the course of the last 50 to 100 years, the American church has done a real disservice to young people specifically, but all people generally on giving an understanding of why the Bible is so condemning of sexual immorality, including premarital sex. Mm -hmm. And it's not difficult. The Bible, I believe, is clear as to why premarital sex is opposed to God's best for our lives. Yet it seems like we've wanted to take this like, um, nope, it's bad, the end. I don't want to talk about it. Don't ask me about it. I don't want to hear about it. None of that. Right. And I think it's created this real schism between those who have a responsibility of defending the gospel message and defending the Bible and those who might not have an understanding of it, but have have all too easily been led to believe that the Bible is just a series of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and take into yeah. account that now we're in a postmodern age where people are making really clever arguments about why it's actually healthy mm-hmm. for you to have sex with your partner before you're married. That's actually a good idea if you want to have a safe and secure relationship. And if we don't know better and if we don't stand up for that, those arguments can be confusing at the very least and convincing at the worst. Totally. Um, for yeah. us as couples and for our for our kids. So I want to talk about that. So probably won't be a surprise to you to know that in order to talk about sex, we have to first talk about God generally. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to start by just asking for our discussion, babe, what does the Bible say about our relationship with God. And it will make sense. Bear with me for the next 15 or so minutes because I want to talk about our relationship with God, our relationship with the Holy Spirit, and what the Bible and says about marriage. what the heck marriage. does that have to do with sex? Exactly right. It will tie together, I promise you. So, what does the Bible say about our relationship with God? Well, if you've been around the Bible for very long at all, you've probably heard John 3.16, which says what, babe? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's right. So, right straight away, what do we see about God? We see a God who loves us so much that he sent his only Son 
to bridge the gap between us and him. Mm. So right straight away, we see a God that loves you so much, nothing is withheld from you. His only son, even, is not withheld from you. Then we go to John 1, 12, and 13. It says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that mean him being Jesus, believed in Jesus' name, he gave the right to become children, children okay. of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, as I thought about this, I thought, God is a lot like a father-in-law to mm-hmm. us, right? I mean, he sent his son in the same way that for those of you who have sons, um, or if you are a son, or if you've ever known a son, mm-hmm. um, you probably know that the, a lot of the father and mother's responsibility is to raise up that son to be a a productive member of society, right? To hopefully, if they come at things from a godly standpoint, to be a godly man. But what's one of the main things parents are raising their sons to be? Men. Men, specifically someone's husband yes. at some point. Right. And so as dads, sometime we're going to send our son off, right? Now maybe we send him off into marriage because maybe he still lives with us when he finds that woman. Maybe he gets married sometime down the road. But the point is that what happens when our son finds that woman and marries them? How do we look at they that woman? They in their mom and dad's house forever and ever. Amen. No, they don't. Let's how, just, do we, how do we look at that woman? Stop and pause while I have a little cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. For your boys? Yes. Yes, yes I know. This is, we're rubbing up against the mama's heart here. All right, sorry. But, anyway. but well, how are you going to look at those women that they marry? Don't, but <laughs> I see. No. <laughs> see, you're guessing us right in the weeds. <laughs> how am I going to look at the women? Yeah, I mean, what, what do you consider them once our sons Daughters. marry them? Right. Just like we just saw in John 1, 12, and 13. Right? If we say yes to Jesus' gift of faith and mercy and love, then God gave us the right to become his children. Right. See, there's a picture there that I believe is being set up in the Bible between God, Jesus, and us as his people. Mm-hmm. Right? Jesus was the groom who left heaven to seek us out, to find a way to offer us salvation so that we could spend eternity in intimate relationship, not just with Jesus, but with Jesus' Father, God, who's in heaven preparing a place for us. <clears throat> Romans 11, 11 through 36 puts it this way. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, that's us, non-Jews, our Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump and the root is holy, so are the branches. This is the important part. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you who are grafted in. Note then that the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even then, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Now, look, that's a lot of words. It's a big passage. Um, But we see a horticultural reference there, which is has a direct tie to marriage Mm -hmm. right so what what paul's talking about there he's talking about the jews and the gentiles and he's he's addressing the the fact that the jews and the gentiles uh in rome romans was a book to the roman church were arguing about who should be running the church um but what paul's saying is 
Jews, don't discount the Gentiles because while the Gentiles were not the people of God, right? If we look at the Old Testament, we see the Jews were the people of God. While the Gentiles were not the people of God, Jesus' ministry here on earth has grafted us in. Now, that's a horticultural reference where you would take a branch from one type of of olive tree in this case, and you would cut it with like a point at the end. And then you could take the wild, the, the other olive tree, and cut one of the branches to make like a little socket. And if you put those together and bound them up, then at some point in the relatively near future, you would be able to take that bandage off and the tr- that, that branch has become one. Right. The, the tree uh, has made that branch part of itself. That's right. It healed itself to include that branch. Well, so so what's God saying? He's saying, Gentiles, I'm bringing you into my family through this miracle known as salvation through faith in Christ. And I'm allowing you to be just join into my family tree, right? Well, if we think about here on earth, where do we find a picture of that? I mean, marriage and yeah how so right so so yeah so how is marriage similar to that so kind of like what you were saying earlier you have when you get married you get another family is that what you're talking about right yeah so what's your last name mcmahon no it's not (laughs) it's warnock it's warnock right but you weren't born to my parents right so how is it that you're a part of our family i was grafted in through marriage that's exactly right Right. and so at that time when we stand before the altar and you are grafted into my family and it's not just that way right i mean in a similar way i was grafted into your family sure um, because i'm treated by your parents as (laughs) that's right that's right Uh, tragically i know to you (laughs) um but you know that that there's this thing that happens where you like you become something that you weren't mm. before our marriage, and we just throw this around like, you know, it's get married, normal, no big deal. You right? just get married, and then you you know whatever. You have a new but family. right, but marriage is something we've covered it a ton of times. It's something spiritual that the Lord designed. Why did He design it? I would make the argument, and we'll prove it over the next few minutes that He created marriage. To be a picture of his relationship he desires to have with us. So then how does that tie in at all to sex? Because just as marriage is designed to be a picture of God's relationship with us, I believe sex is designed to be a picture of our relationship with the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. and the designed relationship and intimacy that we have both with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, Romans 10, 8 and 9 said, But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The reason why I put that in there is because it requires, we see it right there, it requires a verbal affirmation to enter into the family of God Mm -hmm. right now. Does that mean that if you don't say it out loud, you can't be saved? Well, no, I think that that, that's, that is an extension of, you know, I I believe that if you are, you know, locked up as a prisoner of war in a cave and your tongue is cut out and you have an understanding of who Christ is in that cave, you can come to saving faith in the Lord. Right. I don't believe in these specific like mechanical things, but I do believe there is an, an affirmation that is required in order to enter the family of God. We see it right there. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In the same way, it's been long-standing tradition forever that there is an affirmation required in order for us to enter into a marriage covenant together. Mm -hmm. Right? It's more than just, hey, we both showed up here and we're holding hands, now we're married. Right? It takes a it takes an affirmation. Romans 12, 1 through 12, last thing I want to say in this first Portion. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, the thing I was talking with another um, kind of marriage champion earlier today, and we were talking about this verse. Briefly, because he was making the point, he's right, 
we think that the natural state of humans is that we will get better over time, right? That's actually the whole idea that evolution is based on, mm -hmm. is that over time we will adapt and become better. Sure. That stands in direct contrast to the Bible and specifically to this verse. You have two choices. You can either be conformed to the ways of this world or be transformed by the renewing of your mind before God. You can't have both. And the clear implication is, if you are being conformed to the world, you're caught in this entropy cycle that leads to ultimately what's God's or what's Satan's plan for you. Death. Death, right? Death Eternal and destruction. Death, right? That's right. So if you're being conformed to the world, you're spiraling down this spiral. But being transformed by the renewal of your mind brings us closer and closer to the Lord. As we know, it's the Holy Spirit that is doing that transformation. Well, it's the same thing with us in marriage, right? If we just sit and hang out, pretty soon, you know, what he what he made the point earlier today when I was talking to this, this other champion for marriage is he was saying, you know, the real problem is then pretty quick you look around and you what you have is a roommate. Right. And he's right. Um, that's, that's the problem. Yeah, is, things don't tend towards order or greatness that's that right you have to work towards that that's right science has actually confirmed that right what you just said is a scientific fact things tend toward disorder not towards order right it's the same way this is a biblical principle i just read it it's the same way in our marriage our marriage tends towards dysfunction not towards higher function if we're not serious about transforming our marriage by the renewal of our vows, right? I mean, you could say it that way. And I don't mean the formal renewing of our vows, although that can be nice, but the daily renewal of my covenant to the Lord for your benefit. Yeah, think of a, a house. If you leave it empty and you don't work on it at all, you just let it be. It's not, You're not going to come back to it 10 years later and it be in the same condition that you left it, exactly right? right? You're going to come back and, and the the earth will have kind of you i mean it, it first of all it's going to be nasty on the inside and the earth will start kind of growing around it mm -hmm. you know you're you're not going to see it in the same condition it it will have started to kind of be destroyed on the inside and the outside yep. and and it'll just kind of be in disrepair a lot of disrepair it doesn't it doesn't just stay in pristine condition that's right but and that is the way it is with our our own marriages and our own relationships with the Lord. If we just kind of walk away from them and let them be and not really work on them, they they will fall into disrepair. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. So those are my initial proofs for showing you that God's does our relationship with God is a picture of of God's design for marriage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now you might be going, okay, that's great. You just spent 16 minutes telling me about marriage. What does that have to do with sex? Great question. Let's talk about that. And the next thing I want to talk about is what the Bible says about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> we believe that the Godhead is three persons in one God, right? God the Father, we just talked about God the Father. God the Son, that's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, the Holy Spirit is something that uh, the church, in in my estimation, <clears throat> sorry pastors if, if you're watching this and you have done a good job of this, but in my estimation, I believe the church has done a really poor job of discussing the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers, which is a tragedy because <clears throat> that is a lot like, for a reason I'm going to share here in a minute, talking about humanity and never talking about women. And right now, we can understand a little bit of how that can draw the ire because for a long time men have been pompous and not given women their due and their the comeuppance is happening a little bit now with regards to that and it should for some of the things that have happened in the past and some of it's ridiculous let's be real but some of it's also honest well in the same way when we ignore the the, the power of the holy spirit we really ignore an important part of what we believe about the godhead so john 14 15 through 18 this is Jesus speaking. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that you may abide that may abide. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be inside you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. That word helper there is the same word, although it's the Greek word, but the Hebrew word's the same word that is used in Genesis Mm -hmm. when God describes who? Eve. Eve. That's right. Helper, help me. That's right. So we look at that verse in Genesis, we being secular society, and go, "Uh, what, a woman, what? We can't, women can't be just be helpers. But think of that now in terms of what God says here in John 14. He gives the same description, the same name, to one of the three pieces of the Godhead that he gives to women back in Genesis. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing honor. Right. And it doesn't mean subservient. It means encourager, lifter up, um oftentimes carrier on your back, right? I mean, it's it's the amazing role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. It's the same role that God designed Eve and by extension all women to play in life, right? With regards to, to, to life around us. And then I wanted to point out, and this might make you uncomfortable a little bit, but it's not meant to be uncomfortable the reality of the matter is when we see the holy spirit described and i'm going to read three more verses right now about it you see the holy spirit described as being inside you Mm -hmm. right it is a completion of the coming together right we've recognized jesus is lord we've confessed with our mouth that he's lord believed in our heart god raised him from the dead and jesus said it's not enough that you just see me from a distance and say that but i want part of me to be inside of you uh, that's how close I want to be to you, mm-hmm. right? I want to be able to guide you from within you in all areas of your life. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians three sixteen says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20. Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Remember that, you're not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. 1 Timothy 1.14 says, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. It's clear, and, and I could have put many more verses in there. It's very clear that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Right? It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what we, that's what we call that. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Right? It's his power that allows you to be the husband that the Lord designed you to be, to be the wife the Lord designed you to be, to raise kids the way that he desired you to raise them. That's that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Right? And so it's also that indwelling of the Holy Spirit that should remind us when we see other people who do not have a relationship with the Lord acting the fool or doing horrible things, we must in all honesty say, but for the power of the Holy Spirit, so go I, right? Because I'm capable of doing every horrible thing that anybody else is capable of doing, but for the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, Mm -hmm. directing and guiding me. Mm -hmm. So sex, what? (laughs) Well, (laughs) If you look at Andrea and my relationship as a picture of God's love for us and his sending his son and Andrea's grafted into my family and I'm grafted into her family, well, what is the sex piece of it? The sex piece of it is a reflection of the Holy Spirit coming inside of us to cement that relationship that we have with Jesus. Because it's the Holy Spirit, the Bible is clear, the Holy Spirit is the assurance of salvation. Just like sex is designed to be the icing on this marriage cake. Right. It's the thing that binds us together. Right. Right? And, and, and that is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So I believe that sex is designed by God to be that picture Now, look, there are practical things. We're going to talk about them here in a second as to why sex is great. And if you've listened to our um, podcast for very long, you know I'm a big fan um, of sex. And uh, Andrea will give me a hard time about it quite often (laughs) on this podcast. But I'm a huge fan of sex. And and I'm a big proponent of it. Not just because it feels good, although it does. But because I believe it's a critical part of a healthy marriage. So what does the Bible say about marriage? I'm going to go through these real quick because if you've listened to our podcast in the past, this Mm -hmm. is all review. 
But if you've not, I want you to hear this. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become... One flesh. One flesh. Right? And yes, Ethan that said, means... Amen. Amen. That's right. <laughs> yes, that means emotionally. Yes, that means um, spiritually from the standpoint of spiritually moving together as one. Um, but it also does mean physically. I mean, it says one flesh. So coming together physically as well. Genesis 2.25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Why did I even put this in here? Well, I wanted he wants to, to talk about naked. Darn right. right. <laughs> no. I, I wanted to put this in here because there's probably a fair number of people that are watching this and their, scrin- their skin's crawling a little bit. Um, because it can be uncomfortable to talk about sex. I believe that's why the church didn't talk about it um, with any kind of substance for years and years and years. I believe that's changing. Um, but it's, I, w- I want you to know God's design plan was that all of us are just walking around naked and unashamed. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yes, you would not be a fan. So I hate being naked. Like if I could take a shower with a wetsuit on, I would. <laughs> I have always hated being naked. And that's why she smells, if any of you guys have been around. Because she always wears a wetsuit into the shower. <laughs> but yeah, that, God's design is that we are completely and fully transparent. Mm-hmm. Right? And and inclu- that includes talking about sex, which is what we're doing right now. Ephesians 5, 22 through 32 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands out to the Lord, for the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or, spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. Not For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body grafted in. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. There Paul flat says it, what I was, what I was making the argument of earlier. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So marriage is clearly designed to be a picture of Christ and the church. Mm-hmm. Right? In fact, throughout the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. Um, so that just f- further cements the argument I was making at the beginning with regards to, to marriage being a picture of God and his desired relationship with us. Well, now what does the Bible say about sex? Well, the Bible says quite a bit about sex. Um, certainly, you, we think of, if, we, if we've if we read through the Bible before, you think of books like Song of Solomon that talk quite a bit about sex. Um, and at some point, you and I should revisit that. There's all kinds of things in Song of Solomon, things with regards to indications of oral sex and all sorts of fun things um, within yeah. marriage that I think a lot of people would be shocked if they read through that and thought about what they were reading because it's put in there poetically. So if we sort of like right, it doesn't, it doesn't poeticize like, everything. Yeah, it doesn't just use the terms that we use. That's right. That's right. But there's tons about sex and, and, and really about the freedom that we have in sex in Song of Solomon. You know, oftentimes we within the church and people thinking about the church think we're super restrictive when it comes to things like sex. But uh, really, the Bible's pretty clear that sex is not meant to be restrictive. Um, It's meant to be open and free within the confines of marriage that it was designed to be in. Wide open. That's right. So 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5 says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That was an argument that was going around the church in Corinth, that that you shouldn't marry, not marry, you you just shouldn't be having sex. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, that word is pornea, we'll talk about that here in a second, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, that's sex, and likewise (laughs) the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another of sex, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again. That's sex. 
<laughs> so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what is this saying? Well, a couple things I wanted to point out. I wanted to point out that verse there because we need to think about what this means in marriage. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Yeah. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now I want to go back, if I can find it here quickly, to something I read about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Where is it? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? What's the next part say? You are not your own. You are not your own, for you were bought bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It's that same principle. The Holy Spirit, who is given to us by the Lord, he comes and indwells, lives within us. And what does that mean? My body is no longer mine. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit leads, so I go. When I enter into marriage, my body no longer becomes only my body. It becomes Andrea's body, right? And I'm not to withhold that from her wrongfully because it's not mine. I've given it over sacrificially to her. And in the same way, Andrea to me. This is a very difficult concept for a lot of modern couples to wrap their head around. Right? And and I would even go even further to say a lot for a lot of modern women to wrap their head around. Sure. Yeah, I mean very difficult because you really shouldn't have a say over your own sex life, right? As far as really it should be if your husband wants it, you should be giving it. Right. But I also want to say there should be boundaries within that. I mean, you know, if if you struggle with issues from your past, abuse from your past, and your husband is not, has no care for that, and um, you're not trying, you know, you're trying to work through that. Anyway, there's there's issues with that, but, but that can't be used as an excuse with abuse issues from your past, or I have these boundaries of things that I'm just not comfortable with and trying to have an understanding between the two of you of maybe I can be interested in those things in the future, but right now I'm not. You know, I think I think that conversation is something that always needs to be ongoing and not just a slam the door, I'm not doing this ever, or a you should be you should be doing whatever I want you to do whenever I want you to do it kind of thing you know so I want to just have an aside and I know you don't really like probably the way I'm saying it but but I just want to have an aside where if your husband's body is your own or you you, you get to have authority over your husband's body and vice versa you also have to have an understanding that you should be um you should be loving your husband or loving your wife in the same it, more than you love your own self yeah and that's so true. and regarding them as higher than yourself right and and those those sensitive things that you're talking about and absolutely your spouse should be sensitive to those things but when's really the time when you should probably be having that conversation before you're having sex Is i would argue before, before, you're, before you're, married. you're married oh of course yeah because because if his thing is like, man, it's really important to me that we have sex eight, six times a week. And you go, yeah, but I have issues in my past. I really want to have sex once a month. You need to have that conversation Absolutely. up front. Because I would still say that once you're married, you're committed. Absolutely. And your body's not yours anymore. Issues from the past or not. Um, so, now, you shouldn't be marrying someone who's a douchebag when it comes to respecting your body right. and issues from the past. But when right? you marry somebody, you also have to understand that your body is no longer your own. That's the point. And so there's there ha, there is a so for Nathan and me, I have sexual abuse in my in my past. So for us, there definitely been times where you know we're maybe in the middle of having sex, and I'm like, I can't do this. And he's not he his answer is not sorry. This is what I want right now. You have to, blah, blah, you need to finish this, you know? Yeah, right. Um, That's right. He, he's very caring and understanding. And my heart is, I want this part of my marriage, and I want this to be a, 
a good part of my marriage. And so I'm not going to just shut the door on this and say never again, no more or whatever. Right. You know? So maybe in the moment it's something that, that ends and gets shut for the time, but then there's a conversation that follows and yeah. we're working on that and praying about it and all that sort of thing. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Totally. So anyway, sorry. No, that's great. There. Yeah, that's really that's a good aside. In fact, there probably could be an entire episode just on that yes. one aside. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that we were going to talk about that word pornea, which says in there at the beginning of First Corinthians seven one through five. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what they wrote to Paul, and Paul's saying hogwash within the confines of marriage. But that word is pornea. It's a word that appears 24 times in 25, oh sorry, 25 times in 24 verses in the New Testament. Starting first in Matthew 19, Jesus brings it up when Jesus is discussing divorce. And what he says is uh, anyone who who divorces uh, uh, their spouse for any reason other than for sexual immorality, pornea. And so what does that word pornea mean? Well, when we look biblically, we see it has a varied Meaning it means everything from homosexuality to bestiality to incest lust. to lust um, to, uh, you know, broad catch all of any sex that is not um, within, marriage. within within the but not just within marriage within the confines of what God has designed sex to be, because we can have pornea within our marriage. I mean, for one thing, the word pornea is from where we get the word Porn, pornography. Right. Pornography within your marriage is pornea. It is sexually immoral and it is well, a sin. Well, yeah, I would say that's not and, within your marriage, but... Right, but I mean, but I, but there's plenty of people that go, well, I, my wife and I watch pornography together and it's mm-hmm. the two of us together, so who cares? Well, God cares. It's wrong. Right. Um, because you're really, as Andrea said, allowing another man and or woman into your bedroom. Um, and that's wrong. Right. Same way, allowing actually other men or women into the bedroom of your marriage is wrong. Um, so certainly you can have sexual immorality within marriage, um, but sexual immorality is a broad category there that, that combines a whole bunch of things. Um, so I just I wanted to point that out because we see that verse in the Bible in the New Testament, and it is the opposite of what we would say sex is designed to be. So what is sex designed to be? Sex is designed, biblically, to be between one man and one woman who are married to each other within the confines of their marriage. Um, That's what it's designed Mm -hmm. to be. Now, I want to talk about, because certainly there are all kinds of people that would say, well, you know, we're getting married next week, or I'm sure this is the one I'm going to marry, or you got to try the car before you drive it, or... um, (laughs) You gotta drive, drive, you gotta drive the car before you buy it. That's the one. Um, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever excuse there is. And I want to use an analogy here, because the other thing I hear from a lot of people is, "Well, we had sex before we got married, and our marriage has been fine." That's not a reason for doing it. Mm. And here's the analogy I want to give: five out of six people who play Russian roulette say they turned out fine. Mm. Right, the sixth person blows their brains onto the black onto the back wall, right? I mean, that's how Russian roulette works. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you would say I don't have consequences from that is not a reason for saying therefore it's a good thing. Um, and if we're serious, if you're watching this and you're in a dating or an engaged relationship, are do you not love the person you're with enough to say? I will do whatever I can to make sure that my my future wife or my future husband and I are not the sixth person pulling the trigger in Russian roulette. Right? I mean, would any of us not say that's a dangerous enough thing that I'm willing to just forego playing Russian roulette at all right. for the sake of me and the person that I claim to love more than anyone else not being the one that blows our relationship all over the back wall? Right. Yikes. So what I want to talk about as we talk about sex is I want to talk about sex in marriage and what it's designed to do versus sex before or outside of marriage and how those two things are compared to each other. So what are some purposes of sex that we see in the Bible? Well, uh, it binds a relationship together, mm-hmm. right? Just as the Holy Spirit within, uh, within us binds us to Jesus and guides us, sex within marriage binds us together. I don't know if you've noticed this in your own marriage, but oftentimes 
when Andrea and I are the least likely to get into an argument about something, it's in the minutes and hours after we have sex. <laughs> it just, I, I don't know what it is. There's something about sex that just draws us together. That's true. And usually we can have deeper, a lot deeper conversation too after sex, you know? That's right. We're just more willing to have deeper conversation. Totally. That's right. That's right. So how does this compare to sex before or outside of marriage? Well, uh, sex, I believe, is a spiritual act for the reasons we talked about with regards to what it represents. And it binds people together. When you might say, well, that, that's great. a positive thing. I'm, I love this person I'm with. That's great. Guys, there are so many people out there whose hearts are bound to someone not their spouse because they had sex with that someone years ago and bound their heart together with them and cannot and get past it. let me it. tell you, we know a lot of those people. Yep. Just because we do a, a lot of marriage ministry and we're blessed to do that. And unfortunately, we know a lot of those people. That's right. Decided to have sex outside of marriage and their hearts. And a lot of those are, we thought we were going to get married yep. or something like that. And some of them aren't for sure. But but it's a tragedy when their hearts are still bound to other people that are not their spouse. That's right. And it will just wreak havoc oh, in your relationship. Because awful. no matter how much you want to be with your spouse... That tie that you have to this other person, it's it's really hard to break that. And oftentimes take this takes the miraculous work of the Lord in order to break that that we call it a soul tie, that tie that you have to another person. And that's complicated even more by these all these people that you had sex with before you were married and now you've got ties to these people over here and those people over there and now you're trying to reach out to your spouse to be close and intimate with them but there's all these ties holding you back and it is tragic within a marriage yeah number two uh, it relieves stress i mean that's seems like a pretty straightforward thing about sex um it does relieve stress i mean it's it, it is a stress reliever lots of people i mean this is a pretty common thing about sex so within marriage that's great because uh also if you have a lot of sex you will potentially have a lot of stressors running around your house like maybe four of them that are between the ages of 10 and 1 uh, and so stress relieve relieving stress is you know something Which, you should do five or six times stress. a day it also creates but, more stressors uh, excuse me <laughs> yeah that's true those little stressors that's true see own. this is god's sense of humor right the stress reliever creates the things that create the desire for more stress relievers they're, they are stressors, but they're, no, we love, they're we, much more than that on most days. That's true. They're blessings, and we've talked about that. It's great. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a stre it's stress uh, relief. So how does this compare to sex before or outside of marriage? Well, oftentimes, now it may not always, but oftentimes it ends up being a stress inducer outside of marriage. Because, see, here's the great thing about sex within marriage. Andrea and I are committed to each other through thick and thin no matter what. Mm -hmm. So Very if cool. I suck at sex, <laughs> we're still committed to each other, right? I mean, if I'm really bad at it, if I have a bad day, right, um, the, you know, my performance isn't up to par or whatever the case may be, <laughs> then Andrea still loves me and is committed to me. And I don't have to walk around going... Oh man, I could, that was not good, and I don't know. What, I just had other things on my mind, and you know, oh man, and it can just it can really be a stressor because whether you want to say it is or isn't, relationships outside of marriage are performance based relationships yeah. because you're not committed to each other. Right? You may say I'm committed to you, but I mean. There's no actual commitment tying the two of you together. Yeah. Now, this next thing that I'm going to say goes into your body is not your own and what Nathan's talking about. So maybe you've had a really difficult day with the kids and you've been up since like 3 a.m. and you're tired as tired can be and your husband really wants to have sex and you just say, all right, can I just lay here? <laughs> can I just lay here? And he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> And you have... That's not a real... I mean, that's a friend of ours. And you so. feel like, that's all right. Because he's not... He, he's committed. I'm committed. 
my body is not my own, and that's great, but I don't have it in me to, like, really take much part of this. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, that's it's real. It's a reliever of stress and a, and a, you know, a following through of of vows to the Lord, which yep. is which is a beautiful thing. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, the second one is, is similar to a relieve stress, which is that sex is fun. And it's designed to be fun. Now, you know, when, when sex becomes all about performance, it's not fun um, mm. anymore. <clears throat> and so, again, you know, making sex a part of this performance that you're doing where I need to get this person to continue to be with me because they don't have to be and we could break up and then go do something else, <clears throat> is it makes sex less fun. Yeah. Um, and it's meant to be fun. Um, set you back. <clears throat> Uh, next, it produces children. And the negative side of this, oftentimes for sex outside of marriage or before marriage, is it produces children. Um, right. And so, you know, in order for it not to produce children, you have to essentially take action to tell the Lord he is not allowed to give you children at that time. Um, which is maybe a preview to a future episode we will talk about contraception. But a positive thing is it produces children. A negative thing for premarital is produces children. And that can be a real problem, right? For the for the child as well as for you guys. Um, it is a spirit it is a marital act of worship. A lot of people don't think of sex as a marital act of worship, but it is. Um, clearly designed to be a way that we together create a picture of our relationship with God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. It's an act of worship that we are able to do as a couple. Now, does that mean we throw on, you know, praise and worship music every time we have sex and make it this big, you know, thing? I think we've done that zero times. Mm, I there are, can guarantee you we've done it zero times. There are some people, though, that will pray before and or after having sex. And I think that's amazing. We've never done that. Never done that. But, no. but, but I mean, for them, as they're, they as catch they feel more called, of that, wor- they've caught more of that yep. worship part of it. Yep. Yep. So what does that say about premarital sex? This is where the sleeping with the enemy part comes in. When you have sex before marriage or outside of marriage, it's still a an act of worship. The question is, who are you worshiping? Oh, yikes. So if you are having sex, if we believe that sex is designed to be a picture of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, once we have entered into that intimate relationship with God, then if you are allowing something else to indwell you, other than the Holy Spirit, there's a name for that, right? It's idol worship and demon worship. That's what, I mean, let's just be real. That's what it is, right? I mean, you either can worship the Lord and his, mm-hmm. and his um, you know, the spiritual beings that he controls, which we don't worship the angels, but, but he controls them. Or we can worship Satan and the beings that he controls. Mm-hmm. Those are the two choices, right? Now, we might call it something fancy. Oh, I worship, you know... This idol or whatever. No, what you worship is Satan and his and his beings. The whole New Age thing, all that, is nothing but a veiled worship of Satan and demonic beings. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. So, when we pervert the picture of marriage and the picture of sex by putting it in a place it is not designed to be, it is nothing short of devil worship. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And you might think, man, you're way out off the deep end, but... That's what I'm saying, is sex is designed to be a marital act of worship. When we take it outside of that context, it is adultery not just against our spouse or future spouse, but against the Lord. And you can see that. Go through and read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. See how how those guys describe the idolatry that the Israelites were doing before the Lord. They call it not idolatry. They call it adultery, Mm. right? A perversion of the right relationship before the Lord. And that's what sex before marriage or outside of marriage is. It is a perversion of a beautiful thing that the Lord has given Mm -hmm. us. Finally, it is a submission of the marriage to the Lord. Right. And we talked about that quite a bit with kind of that little, the, the side, the side discussion that we had. It is me submitting myself to you as my wife As an act of worship to the Lord, as an act of submission to the Lord. So if I'm saying, well, I know this is meant to be 
an act of worship within my marriage. I'm not married, but I just really want to have sex with her, so that's what I'm going to do. It's not an act of submission. It's actually an act of rebellion against the Lord, Mm -hmm. which is not where we want to be. So you might be listening to this and you might go, okay, well, great. So I currently am in a sexual relationship with my girlfriend, my fiance, a woman other than my spouse or a man other than my spouse. What do I do now? Here's where I want to be super clear. When we look at the Lord, we see a God who, as we talked about in the very beginning, loves you desperately and desires close relationship with us the bible talks about christ and it says while we were still sinners Mm -hmm. christ died for us he doesn't wait for you to get your life right so that he can meet you he asks you to meet with him right now so that he through the indwelling of the holy spirit can help you get your life right right not as a way of um being a better person but as a way of conforming your life to him, not conform through the trans through the uh, transforming of your mind, rather than conforming yourself to the world around you. So, um, here's what I would say: You know now it's wrong. Stop. That's the first thing. Stop right now. Commit to yourself. I'm not going to violate the will of the Lord with regards to sex anymore. Period. I know it's going to be hard, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, and <clears throat> stopping. Is probably a you need to take nuclear options. Yep. Either to stop or not enter that because we are sexual beings. We yep. God has created a desire in us for that. That's right. And and it's a great desire when it's inside of marriage, but when it's not, a lot of times we have to take nuclear options to fall through on a commitment to not have sex outside of marriage. So right. that may mean you no longer meet with a person of the opposite sex, sex in a private in a, wa- a private, private way you are maybe never alone until your wedding day with a person of the opposite sex yep because not because you want to you know be treated like a child feel like a child but because you want to honor the lord and honor your spouse and <clears throat> and the gift that you can give them yep in your marriage with with your body and so so probably the best course of action is to never be alone with somebody of the opposite sex ever until you're married right and that sounds dumb but would you rather sound dumb or would you rather be honoring yeah good good call babe it's also probably going to take couples to come alongside you if you're currently in a relationship and you're sexually active and you want to put the brakes on that it's going to probably take another couple that's more mature than you and your and the and the guy or gal that you're with coming alongside you and helping you through that and i don't I'm, i don't mean by that that you're immature i mean more more mature in the faith mm-hmm. that can help to hold you accountable that can help unpack some of the things we've talked about here today about what the bible says about marriage um you know that's probably what it's going to take um, and that will be, you know, beneficial, you know, in the long run to, to your to your marriage, to right. your relationship. Yep. And most That's importantly great. to the Lord. Well, I hope, guys, this has helped you to see the importance of sex within marriage and the importance of keeping sex within the bounds of marriage. Because uh, sleeping with the enemy has a lot of long-term consequences on your marriage, stuff that we didn't have the time today to even really get into about mm-hmm. the effects that that can have on your marriage. But we spend hours every year sitting down and helping couples walk through the consequences of not waiting until they're married to have sex and and how destructive that can be on their relationship so don't let that be you right right yep awesome guys thank you so much for joining us really appreciate you being here for this marriage monday episode please join us on family friday can't wait to get into that with you guys until then have a great week and remember god is for your marriage Hey, thanks for joining us on Marriage by Design. If you were impacted by this video, like it by hitting the thumbs up below. Also, don't forget to subscribe. And once you subscribe, hit the bell icon so you can be notified when new episodes release. 
Excellent. Also, one of the huge pillars of our show is interactivity between us and you. So we would love you to comment down in the comments below if you have thoughts about this video or if you have questions or other things you'd like to, like to see considered in the future. In addition, if you'd like, you can email us. That's marriagebydesignpodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram at marriagebydesignpodcast or you can find us on Facebook by searching Marriage by Design Podcast. Finally, if you want to, you can tweet at us. We do have a Twitter account. That is at marriagexdesign. Thanks, and have a great day.